The Bhagavad Gita began with an inquiry of Dhritarashtras. He was hopeful of the victory of his sons, assisted by great warriors like Bhishma, Drona, and Karna. He was hopeful that the victory would be on his side. But after describing the scene on the battlefield, Sanjay told the king, you are thinking of victory, but my opinion is that where Krishna and Arjuna are present, there will be all good fortune. He was directly, he directly confirmed that Dhritarashtra could not expect victory for his side. Victory was certain for the side of Arjuna because Krishna was there. Krishna's acceptance of the post of charioteer for Arjuna was an exhibition of another opulence. Krishna is full of all opulences and renunciation is one of them. There are many instances of such renunciation. For Krishna is also the master of renunciation. The fight was certain, the fight was actually between Duryodhan and Yudhisthira. Arjun was fighting on behalf of his elder brother Yudhisthira. Because Krishna and Arjuna were on the side of Yudhisthira, Yudhisthira's victory was certain. The battle was to decide who would rule the world and Sanjay predicted that the power would be transferred to Yudhisthira. It is also predicted here that, you, that Yudhisthira, after gaining victory in this battle, would flourish more and more because not only was he righteous and pious, but he was also a strict moralist. He never spoke a lie during his life. There are many less intelligent persons who take Bhagavad Gita to be a discussion of topics between two friends on a battlefield. But such a book cannot be scripture. Some may protest that Krishna incited Arjuna to fight, which is immoral, but the reality of the situation is clearly stated. Bhagavad Gita is the supreme instruction in morality. The supreme instruction of morality is stated in the ninth chapter in the 34th verse, manmana bhava One must be 
become a devotee of Krishna. And the essence of all religion is to surrender unto Krishna. Sarva dharma parigyacha manikam shadhanam braja. The instruction of Bhagavad Gita constitute the supreme process of religion and of morality. All other processes may be purifying and may lead to this process, but the last instruction of the Gita is the last word in all morality and religion. Surrender unto Krishna. This is the verdict of the 18th chapter. From Bhagavad Gita, we can understand that to realize oneself by philosophical speculation and by meditation is one process. But to fully surrender unto Krishna is the highest perfection. This is the essence of the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, the path of regulated principles according to the orders of social life and according to the different courses of religion may be a confidential path of knowledge. But although the rituals of religion are confidential, meditation and cultivation of knowledge are still more confidential and surrender unto Krishna in devotional service, in full Krishna consciousness, is the most confidential instruction. That is the essence of the 18th chapter. Another feature of Bhagavad Gita is that the actual truth of the, the actual truth is the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. The absolute truth is realized in the features impersonal Brahman, localized Paramatma, and ultimately the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. Perfect knowledge of the absolute truth means perfect knowledge of Krishna. If one understands Krishna, then all the departments of knowledge are part and parcel of that understanding. Krishna is transcendental, for he is always situated in his eternal pot in his internal potency. The living entities are manifesting of his energy and are divided into two classes eternally conditioned and eternally liberated. Such living entities are innumerable and they are considered fundamental parts of Krishna. Material energy is manifested into 24 divisions. The creation is affected by eternal time and it is created and dissolved by external energy. This manifestation of the world repeatedly becomes visible and invisible. In Bhagavad Gita, five principal subject matters have been discussed. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, material nature, the living entities, eternal time, and all kinds of activities. All is dependent on the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. All conceptions of the Absolute Truth, impersonal Brahman, localized Paramatma, and, other, and any transcendental conception exist within the category of understanding the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The living entity, material nature and time appear to differ, to different, to be different. Nothing is different from the Supreme. 
But the Supreme is always different from everything. Lord Chaitanya's philosophy is that of inconceivable oneness and difference. This system of philosophy constitutes perfect knowledge of the Absolute Truth. The living entity in his original position is pure spirit. He is just like an atomic particle of the Supreme Spirit. That, oh, thus Lord Krishna may be compared to the sun and the living entities to sunshine. Because the living entities are the marginal energy of Krishna, they have a tendency to be in contact with the material energy or with the spiritual energy. In other words, the living entity is situated between the two energies of the Lord. And because, and because he belongs to the superior energy of the Lord, he has a, per, a particle of independence. By proper use of that independence, he comes under the direct order of Krishna. Thus he attains the normal condition, thus he attains his normal condition in the pleasure-giving potency. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purports in the 18th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita in the matter of its conclusion, the perfection of renunciation. So very long purport there by Srila Prabhupada because it's the last verse of the Bhagavad Gita. So Srila Prabhupada was bringing out some of the main points of the Bhagavad Gita. Have you read the Bhagavad Gita? No. Something? Okay. If you study at Chula Long Court, you know Chula Long Court University? They have a course on Bhagavad Gita. They have a Sanskrit department there, and they have a course on Bhagavad Gita. Of course, there's many different interpretations of the Bhagavad Gita. Not everybody is the same. You see, different people present Bhagavad Gita different ways, different messages. It's probably the same. Some people will say Krishna is like a doctor, and Arjuna is a patient. <laughs> it's not really like that. Who is Krishna, first of all? That should be understood. Krishna is Swayam Bhagavan. He is the original personality of Godhead. He is the Supreme Lord. Or we could say he is the, the form of the absolute truth. Arjuna is his devotee. Lord Krishna selected Arjuna to speak the Bhagavad Gita because Arjuna is a devotee and is also a friend of Krishna. So Arjuna and Lord Krishna they would often discuss philosophy together. They would talk to each other about different teachings and messages from the scriptures. You know, in the past, people, everyone would learn these things. Now, today, in Kali Yuga, you know, we're, we're not very educated. But we don't really know too much. Maybe we saw the movie in Ramayana. Ramayana. <laughs> we saw on television. Mahabharat. Something. We know a little from television. But you cannot expect to know everything just by watching cinema. Bhagavad Gita is the art. Lord Krishna's teachings to Arjuna. 
He is explaining to Arjuna the purpose of life, the duty in life. And it was described in the 18th chapter. There's a famous verse there which says, Surrender. Sarva dharmam harinyasna mamikam saranam. Lord Krishna said to Arjuna, Surrender to me. So, surrender. Oh, somebody comes with like, Surrender. I <laughs> surrender. <laughs> so, Krishna comes and he tells Arjuna, He's telling Arjuna, and he's talking to all of us at the same time. Although he's speaking to Arjuna on the battlefield, he's really speaking to every one of us that we have to surrender to Krishna. If we don't surrender to Krishna, then we surrender to the material energy. There's two sides. You see, there's the spiritual energy and the material energy. The spiritual energy, the nature of the spiritual energy is eternal and blissful. You want to be happy? Most of us do. I mean, I want to be happy. Don't you? <laughs> what about you? You sure? <laughs> yeah, we want to be happy. So, the material energy doesn't make us happy. If we approach the, the, the material energy, we won't be happy because the nature of the material energy is temporary. It has a beginning and an end. So the nature of the material world is not joyful, it's not blissful, it's, it's full of ignorance, ignorance, because we're thinking the material energy to be life, to be real, but actually it's not. The body, our bodies are not real. Our bodies are only the dress. Our, you know, the clothes we wear don't have any life. And the body also does not have life. What gives life is the soul. It's the soul which has life. So the soul is not material. The soul is spiritual. We have to learn to take care of the soul. We take care of the body, we take care of our mind, but we neglect the soul. So Bhagavad Gita is teaching us, first of all, to become aware that there's a, we are souls. We're not the body, we are all souls. We have to become aware of it. Then we have to take care of the soul. What is the need of the soul? The soul needs food, just like the body needs food. The soul also needs spiritual food. Where do you get that spiritual food from? From, from Shastra, from chanting. The Maha Mantra, this is our spiritual food. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. welcome. <laughs> oh, welcome to Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> we were missing you. <laughs> Please come home after this. <laughs> <I'm open. laughs> we're just talking about the Bhagavad Gita. We just read the final verse of the Bhagavad Gita. So I'm explaining something of the point from Bhagavad Gita. So, food for the soul. Just like when you're sick, 
there's a medicine and there's a diet. Right? So we are all sick. We are here in the material world. This is not the healthy place. This is the, like the, the sick place. This is where all the sick people are. How do we become healthy? Medicine and diet. Right? Medicine is chanting Hare Krishna. The Mahamantra. And the diet? Krishna Prasad. Right? Krishna Prasad. You need to have the right diet. So, Lord Krishna is giving us these things. He's giving us these teachings. He taught Arjuna. He's teaching all of us. We have to surrender. We have to take shelter. Surrender means to take shelter of Krishna. Krishna is calling us, come, come and surrender. I will give you, he said, I will free you from all <coughs> sinful reactions. I will protect you. Do not fear. So Lord Krishna is telling Arjuna, he's telling all of us, I, he will protect us. But we have to take shelter. We have to go to him. We have to approach him. And how to approach him? We have to approach with devotion. So Bhagavad Gita is about devotion and surrender. Krishna can only be understood by devotion, <coughs> but not by gyan, and not by karma, not by simply work, but by devotion. Arjuna was a devotee. He had devotion. So he could understand Lord Krishna's message. We want to understand we have to cultivate our devotion for Krishna. We all have devotion. We see people, they have the dog. You have a dog? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Many people today, they have the dogs, you know. And you see people, they have a pram. They have to put the dog in a pram. You know? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So many dogs. You know? They, they have a, I was in Taiwan and they had the park in Taiwan. Every the Sunday, bring the dog. It's the dog for the dogs, party for the dog. All these dogs all come in the park. Oh my goodness. So, so people are very devoted to dogs and cats and things, you know. Devotion to Krishna, not so common. But Devotion to dog will bring you back in a dog's body in the next life. But devotion to Krishna can bring you to Krishna, can take you out of the material world. It can bring us into the spiritual world, into the abode of Krishna, into Krishna's abode, Krishna Loka. Right? People like to go to where, you know, People here in Bangkok, they like to go, where do they go? They go to Australia, or they go to London, or even America. But devotee, you can go far beyond all that. Even beyond Swarga, you can go out of the material world, into the spiritual world, into Goloka Vrindavan, Krishna Loka, the land of Krishna with all the cows and enjoy the natural beauty of the spiritual world, which is eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. Not this world, which is a temporary place of misery. We try to be happy here, but how long can you be happy here? Very limited very short time, not for long, because this is not a real home. We don't belong here. We belong there with Krishna. So we have to go there. We have to cultivate a desire to go there, first of all, we have to want to go there. And then 
that you want to go there, then you have to develop your devotion to Krishna. Because without devotion, we won't get in. They won't let us in the door if we don't have any devotion. You know, Chatur Kumar, they all tried to go there. They got stuck at the doorway. They said, where are you going? No, the sons of Brahma, the four sons of Brahma, the four Kumars. The Jai Vijay stopped them. You're just young boys, go away, come back. <laughs> they were the sons of Brahma. But they were Brahma Gyanis, they were not real devotees. But they became devotees. They did develop, they did become devotees. We can also become devotees, but we have to chant, we have to surrender. All right, Hare Krishna. Any question? Who wants to surrender? <laughs> You want to surrender? Really? Oh, very nice. So, Maharaj, I have a question. Yes. So, just now you mentioned that. Uh, uh, so, I have read that uh, intellect is also given by Krishna. He decides, you know, who, who, who should be given 100% intelligence and uh, so on. So, inter intellect is decided by Krishna and it is differently given to every soul. So, just now you gave one example of. Uh, the son, sons of Brahma who knew everything, they were Param Jani. So if that much of intellect was given by Krishna to them, why couldn't they, why were they not the devotees of Krishna? Well, you have to understand that it's not just by knowledge that you become devotee. I said knowledge is not, Jnana is not the qualification. You have to have devotion. Where do you get devotion from? Well, you get devotion from devotees, from people who have devotion. They can give you devotion. But why were they selected as Brahmagyanis? Well, that's, that's their karma, according to their parents. They had that particular nature to be Gyanis, to cultivate knowledge. So according to our nature, we're put into a particular situation. According to our qualification from our past, puts us into a situation in this life, in the present. Nothing is by chance, but it's all according to our own work and our own qualification. We're put into these different situations. So they desired to have that knowledge, they cultivated that knowledge. So they took birth as these Kumaras. So again one more question, uh, So like you said that uh, everything is decided by him, yet he gives certain amount of independence to every soul. So whatever happens, how can we differentiate between was it our independence that we took this decision or was it his will that we, uh, whatever happened, happened? <laughs> well, Krishna gives us that free will. You see, he doesn't force us that we have to do everything what he wants. He gives us that independence. Because without that free will, there's no real love. Right? If I love me or else. <laughs> right? You know? You love me or I'll beat you. <laughs> Is that love? No, no, it's not love. You know? Love has to be natural. It, it can't be forced. So Lord Krishna gives us that free will to love him. He doesn't force us that we have to love him. He gives us that independence. We have that nature. To choose which way do you want to go? Do you want to be in the material world or in the spiritual world? Do you want to be with Krishna or do you want to be in the, this 
Nijiloka, place of death. 